So the last few weeks we've been talking about the church a lot. We'll be talking about the church in the last days and what the church should look like and what we should also be like as individual Christians as well. And one of the things that has always astonished me uh, is that in this day and age we hear very little teaching, uh, especially from the mainstream church, we hear very little teaching about the last days and the return of Christ and things like this. We hardly hear this ever taught now in mainstream churches. Now, 50 or 60 years ago, it was something that was very much taught in the mainstream church. You could go to any mainstream church 50 or 60 years ago and you'd hear sermons about the return of Christ, the last days or the rapture or things like this. But now that we're actually closer to it happening, there's less teaching about it. You think it would be the other way around. You think the closer we get to the return of Christ, the more the churches will be teaching about it. But you can go into any mainstream church today and you'll very rarely hear any mention or talk about the last days or the return of Christ. They may touch on it, but even when these churches do touch on it, they get a lot of it wrong. So we're getting a lot of uh, false teaching as well. Uh, But the thing is, most churches aren't even doing that. They're just not even touching on these subjects whatsoever. And again, it's something you'd think would be happening as we're getting closer and closer to the return of Christ. Every day that goes by is one less day of this age, and yet there's less and less teaching about it. And that is a deception from the devil. That is the devil who has orchestrated this lack of teaching about the last days and about the return of Christ. Now that is actually one of the things that really distinguishes the faithful church from the apostate church, is the faithful church will know the signs of the times. The faithful churches will be teaching about the last days and about the return of Christ. The apostate church, who's turned away from the word of God, will be teaching less and less about this stuff and won't understand about any of the signs or any of the things going on in our world today. That is one of the main factors that really distinguishes the faithful church from the apostate church. There are many factors as well, many other factors, but one of the main factors is the faithful church's ability to discern the last days and to know what's going on and to obviously teach about the return of Christ the closer we get to it. Again, we are getting closer and closer to the return of Christ, and yet we're seeing less and less teaching about it from the mainstream church. That is one of the reasons why God is raising up breakaway fellowships, separatist fellowships, to actually do what other churches are failing to do, and that is to warn people and to get people ready for the last days and the return of Christ. We are seeing world events unfolding at a very, very rapid rate. We are seeing more and more Bible prophecy being fulfilled. We're seeing signs Like globalism, for example, we're seeing big globalist movements taking place. This is things like the European Union or the United Nations or the World Economic Forum or now you have also the World Health Organization. This is a globalist movement, which if I, uh, if you remember that I talked about the Tower of Babel, uh, the globalist movement is not from Christ, it's from Antichrist. The globalist movement is Nimrod, not Christ. The globalist movement is not of Christ whatsoever. We're seeing an increase in globalism, this kind of thing. We're seeing things like mandates being forced upon people. We've seen this already. And again, it's only a foretaster of what's to come. We're seeing increasing numbers of people being forced to comply with things they simply do not wish to comply with. And of course, one of the main things that we're seeing are the events in the Middle East, the things that are taking place right now in the land of Israel, the increasing war against Islamic terrorism. We're seeing this taking place more and more. But one thing we are also seeing is we're seeing Arab nations lining up to make peace with Israel. That might not be the case with Hamas or Hezbollah or Iran, but we are seeing Arab nations such as Qatar or United Arab Emirates or or even Saudi Arabia lining up to make peace with Israel. This was unthinkable 10 years ago, as little as 10 years ago, The idea of Saudi Arabia making peace with Israel was completely unthinkable. And yet now, these Arab nations are actually keen to make peace with Israel. And that, of course, is a major sign of the last days. It's one of the biggest signs that we are living in the last days. Because the Antichrist is going to be someone who will usher in a false peace. It's going to be peace without God. You can't have peace without the Prince of Peace, can we? 
Well, that's what the Antichrist is going to attempt to do, but it's not going to last. So that is why the events in the Middle East, the war that we're seeing in Israel, and also the Arab nations lining up to make peace with Israel is a major sign that we are living in the last days. But what's going on in the mainstream church at the same time? They're completely oblivious to it all. All the things I've just mentioned, the mainstream church are completely oblivious. They are completely blind to what's going on. You won't hear them warning people about these things. You won't hear them talking about Israel. In fact, a lot of them oppose Israel. A lot of mainstream churches are into replacement theology, something we completely reject here at Bread of Life. A lot of these churches now are not only not talking about Israel, but they're anti-Israel. They can't see what's going on when at the same time you actually see a lot of unbelievers who know that there is something going on. There are a lot of people who are not even Christian who understand that we are living in dark days, who know that there is something very sinister going on behind the scenes. Only a couple of years ago we saw uh, in our evangelism in Clacton there was another group out, not a Christian group whatsoever, but there was out campaigning against Things like mandates and things like a cashless society and things like this, they were campaigning against it. So, of course, we, we introduced ourselves to them. Again, these people were not of faith. They were not Christian. We told them all about the mark of the beast and what the book of Revelation says about the last days. It didn't really do much for them. But the point is, is that these are unbelievers who are out there campaigning against some of the things the Bible speaks about, and yet they're not Christian whatsoever. How is it that there are unbelievers out there who know what's going on and they can discern the darkness behind the scenes and yet there are so-called believers sitting in churches on a Sunday who are clueless, who have no idea what's going on. They're completely blind, they're completely asleep. Well, the reason for that is, is because when you have a lamp that has no oil in it, you can't see. I've talked about this parable a couple of times here before, Matthew 25. The foolish virgins had the lamp, but they had no oil in it. The lamp was empty. A lamp without, an oil, without oil in it is useless. It's a pile of metal junk. You can't see anything unless you have oil in the lamp. It's like today, you could say it's the same as having a torch with no batteries in it. A torch with no batteries in it is useless. You might as well throw it away. You need the batteries in able to enable you to see with the torch. Well, those who know their Bibles well will know that oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Whenever you see oil in the Bible, it is a type or picture of the Holy Spirit. Rain, of course, or water is another one, but oil is a major type of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of these churches simply don't know what's going on or can't see what's going on is because they have no oil in their lamp. They have the lamp. The lamp, of course, is the Word of God. Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, Psalm 119. They have the lamp, a lot of people have the lamp. They might have a Bible sitting on their bookshelves collecting dust, but the lamp is no good without the illumination of the Holy Spirit, is it? You can't see anything without the Holy Spirit. This is one of the things that Jesus said in John in chapter 16, in verse 13. He's talking about the Holy Spirit here. He says, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. So one of the things that Jesus is telling us about the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit will teach us things about the last days, about things to come. The reason that certain Christians are able to discern the last days and see what's going on in the darkness is because they have the illumination of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will tell you things to come. The Holy Spirit will teach us what's to come in the last days. But why is it that there are churches who are failing to do this? Why is it there are churches who are blind and oblivious? Because they have no oil in the lamp. And one of the reasons that they have no oil in the lamp, one of the reasons that they have run out of oil, you could say, is because the church fell asleep a long time ago. The Bible talks a lot about sleeping and staying awake. With that in mind, please turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. These churches now have fallen asleep. Instead of staying awake, just like the Bible tells us to do, the Bible talks a lot about staying awake, these churches are no longer awake, but instead they are woke. It's not the same thing. 
Being awake and being woke is not the same thing at all. In fact, one is the opposite to the other. The Bible does not talk about being woke, it talks about being awake. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now, you have to remember, when Paul is writing to these various churches, he's correcting a lot of their doctrine and a lot of their behavior. That's how you must understand pretty much all of Paul's epistles, is that he's correcting the errors in these churches. And a lot of these churches' errors is to do with behavior, their sin, or it's to do with their doctrine. So what Paul is doing here in 1 Thessalonians is he's correcting the doctrine to do with the last days, their false understanding of the last days. That's why in chapter 4, we have the passage about the rapture, the harpezo, the snatching away. He says that we who remain on the earth will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So chapter 4 is what you could say is the rapture chapter. But remember, there were no chapter divisions in the original Greek text, and that's why that thought continues into chapter 5. He's going to continue speaking about the last days and the return of Christ, going into chapter 5 from verse 1. So remember that thought from chapter 4 about the rapture? He's now going to continue that thought into chapter 5 from verse 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. So the times and the seasons. We should know the times and the seasons. You have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Remember last week I said about how the night is a picture of the tribulation. The night is total darkness. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, what is the Antichrist going to try and do? He's going to try and bring in peace. He's going to try and usher in a worldwide peace. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. Of course, Andrew knows about that from a couple of weeks ago. Labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, now he's going to address believers. He's talking about believers now. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So he's saying these people who are asleep, these people who are in the dark, that's not you. You are children of God and therefore you are sons of the light. You are sons of the day. This day should not overtake you as a thief. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Again, he's encouraging them here, exhorting them to stay awake. Let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. I mean, here in Clacton, they're obviously drunk by about 11 o'clock in the morning, but. <laughs> those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet of the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, that's talking about being dead or alive, whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Hallelujah. So we are told to stay awake, not woke. Jesus said many times we are to watch out for the signs. He gave a very specific list of events and things to watch out for. Matthew 24, verse 42. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Notice Paul said, we must know the signs and the seasons, but Jesus says, you do not know the hour that your Lord is coming. So we are to know roughly when the return of the Lord is. We are to know the seasons and the times, but the hour, specifically the hour, we are not to know. Matthew 25, verse 13, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So Jesus many times tells us that we are to watch, we are to be alert, we are to discern the signs of the times. But then, of course, what does Satan do? He raises up false teachers who actually don't do this, but also oppose it. There are so many teachers out there who not only fail to warn people about the end times and to teach people about the signs of the times, but he also raises up people who will oppose it. For example, you have Rick Warren, a false teacher who says that we are not to study end time prophecy. Rick Warren actually says that Christians are not to study end times prophecy. 
Jesus said to watch and be alert and to discern the signs of the times. Wick Warren says, don't study end times prophecy. Which one do you want to believe? In Luke chapter 12, Jesus talks about his return in the character of a thief. Remember what it said in 1 Thessalonians, the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night. Well, Jesus speaks more about the thief in Luke chapter 12. You don't have to turn to it. But basically, the thief here is not the devil, because the devil was often described as a thief, isn't he, in John 10.10. But here, the thief is actually Christ himself. Why? Because he's coming like a thief in the night to snatch away who? You and I, his bride. He's coming like a thief in the night, of course, which is the tribulation. Luke chapter 12, in verse 35. Let your waist be girded, And your lamp's burning. How do you keep a lamp burning? It has to have oil in it. Without the oil, the lamp will not burn. It will not shine. Keep your lamps burning. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Again, we are to be watchful, aren't we? Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. I'll explain in a minute what the watch is, the third and fourth watch, etc. But know this, that if the master of the house had known the hour the thief would come, he would, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. What he's saying is, is if you knew that a thief was coming at a specific time, let's say three o'clock in the morning, if you knew that a thief was coming at three o'clock in the morning, then you'd be on your doorstep at three o'clock in the morning with a shotgun or a baseball bat in your hand, wouldn't you? But what Jesus is saying is, is that you don't have that prior information. You don't have that prior knowledge. And that's why you must be watched for at all times, because you don't know when the thief is coming. We know that the thief comes in the night. People tend to break into houses in the middle of the night. Again, here in Clacton, it might be a bit different. You can get your house burgled probably at 11 o'clock in the morning. Verse 40. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So Jesus here is not only saying that the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you don't know. He's saying he's coming at an hour that you don't expect. He's going to come at a time that we don't expect. Now, this idea of the second watch, the third watch, and the fourth watch, the night was basically divided up into four watches. Basically, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. was the first watch. 9 p.m. to midnight was the second watch. Midnight to 3 a.m. was the third watch. And then 3 a.m. all the way back to 6 a.m. is the uh, fourth watch. The night was divided up into four watches. And in Matthew 14, when Jesus was walking on the water... Uh, It tells us that was taking place in the fourth watch of the night. So this would have taken place after 3 a.m. or before 6 a.m. So the night was divided up into four watches. And basically you would have watchmen patrolling the streets. You'd have watchmen literally guarding the city in those three-hour shifts. Again, it was broken up into four different watches. And you'd have watchmen basically guarding the city, patrolling the city, watching out for enemies during that time. Now that's the physical meaning of a watchman. However, there are also spiritual meanings to the watchmen as well, who are God's watchmen, you and I. We are God's watchmen. Isaiah 62, verse 6, I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord do not keep silent. Churches are silent now about this stuff, aren't they? They're silent. But we are told that we are not to be silent. We are not to hold our peace. We are to speak up. Ezekiel chapter 3 in verse 17 says, Son of man, that's Ezekiel that is, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak the word to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. He's saying, if you fail to go and warn the wicked about their wicked ways, and they fail to turn from their wicked ways because you fail to tell them, then I'll require their blood at your hand. Verse 19, yet if you warn the wicked 
and he does not turn from his wickedness nor from his wicked way. He shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. So when we was out in Basildon yesterday preaching the gospel, the people of Basildon, if they decide to reject the gospel and to not turn to Christ, we've done our job, that's all we can do. That's what Ezekiel chapter 3 is saying. We are just to go and tell people the truth. And then what they do with that is up to them. It's a bit like when a bailiff delivers a court order to someone's house. They can either tear it up or just put it away and pretend it will go away, bury their head in the sand, or they can deal with it and do something about it. The point is, is that as long as the bailiff has done his job, what happens after that is not his responsibility. Again, don't take your anger out on the bailiff, however. Your anger is with who? It's with the high court, isn't it? And of course, people's anger is directed at us, but their true anger is actually for the Most High, because it's the Most High who we are working for. It's the Most High who we are representing as ambassadors of Christ. Hence why they take their anger out on us, but their anger is actually directed at God himself because of the work we are doing for him, just like when a bailiff delivers a court order. Turn now to Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16. We're going to see what happens when you fall asleep. Many of the churches and many of the individual Christians out there, or so-called Christians, should I say, many of them have fallen asleep. This is why they have no idea what's going on. This is why they have been devoured by the enemy. They have fallen asleep. Judges in Hebrew is Shoftim. Shoftim. That is the name of the book of Judges. It means Judges. It's the same meaning. Shoftim. Judges chapter 16. We're going to see the story of Samson and Delilah. Now, Delilah, of course, is one of the wicked women in the Bible. Whenever you see a wicked woman, like Jezebel, or the wicked woman from Zechariah chapter 5, whenever you see a wicked woman, this is a picture of spiritual deception or false religion. And, of course, that is uh, climaxed in the book of Revelation in chapters 17 and 18, where you have the great whore of Babylon, the great whore of Babylon, the final false religious system in this world. Whenever you see a wicked woman, it is talking about spiritual deception and false religion. So Delilah and Jezebel and women, women like this, they all foreshadow Revelation 17 and 18, the great whore of Babylon. And we're going to see here how she got to deceive Samson. So remember, the Philistines have paid Delilah to try and find out what Samson's secret is. Why is he so strong? Why is it that... He's always able to overcome them when they try and apprehend him. Why is it he's so strong? What is his secret? This is what they paid Delilah to try and find out. Judges chapter 16. We'll go from verse 16. Judges chapter 16 from verse 16. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death. You see, women, if you want to get guys to do something, you have to pester them. She pestered him daily. <laughs> Verse 17. That he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God for my mother's womb. There's more about Nazarites in Numbers chapter 6. I have been a Nazarite to God for my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak. And be like any other man. Verse 18. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hands. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he woke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. Samson thought it would be no different to the previous times where he was able to defeat these Philistines. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Very key that is there. He did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. Gaza in the Bible is a city, not a territory. It's, this, it's the city of Gaza that is located today in the territory of Gaza. 
They bound him with bronze fetters and he became a grinder in the prison. So Samson didn't know that the Spirit of God had left him. I think that's the case with many churches today. Many churches carry on as normal. They carry on doing their thing. They carry on having their lukewarm teaching. They carry on having their tea and sandwiches and their jumble sales. But they don't know that the Lord actually left these churches a long time ago. The Lord has departed from a lot of these churches a long time ago. But they don't know it. They don't realise it. That's why they're still there doing their thing. They're still there wasting people's time and people's money. But they don't know that the Lord departed from that church a long time ago. What else happened to Samson? He was blinded. He was blinded, wasn't he? What's happening to the church now? They're blind. This is one of the things that uh, John says about the church of Laodicea, the lukewarm church in the last days in Revelation chapter 3. They are blind. They think they can see. Now, the church of Laodicea was famous for this, this uh, eye ointment, this eye ointment that could cure eye diseases. And, of course, they put their trust in this eye ointment to cure all these eye diseases. But Jesus actually says, you're blind. You might think you can see, but you're actually blind. And that's one of the things that we see in today's modern lukewarm church and amongst the liberal Christians today who have gone woke, that they are blind. They can't see what's going on. Why are they blind? Because they have no oil in their lamp. He was bound in prison. He was bound. The church has been bound up by Satan. Why is it we don't see the church out there preaching the gospel? Why is it we don't see the church out there doing the true work of the Lord instead of just giving out sandwiches and tea to drug dealers who are passing around drugs amongst each other? I'm not exaggerating, they do that. They literally stand there with their free tea and sandwiches whilst they're passing around drugs amongst each other. Why is it that the churches are not doing the true work of the Lord? Because Satan has bound them up. Satan has bound them up. They're not out there preaching the gospel. They're not out there saving souls and getting people discipled. They're just out there wasting people's time. Why? Because they have been bound just like Samson was. Notice they was actually bound with bronze fetters. Bronze in the Bible has to do with judgment. Whenever you see bronze or brass, that is to do with judgment. Where does judgment begin? The house of God, 1 Peter 4. Judgment begins at the house of God. That is why he has allowed Satan to bind up these churches as a judgment. But the point is, is that all of this happened to Samson. He was blinded. He was bound. Why? How did it happen? How did Delilah do it? She got him to go to sleep. She lulled him to sleep. That is how he was overcome. That is how she was able to, first of all, get the Philistines in to cut all his hair off to make him lose his strength. She put him to sleep. The word lulled there is quite interesting. It's very key as well. The word to lull means to lure someone into a false sense of security. It means to lure someone into a false sense of security. So when you lull someone to sleep, it's like when a, a lady is singing to a baby, trying to get the baby to go to sleep. Well, that's what the wicked woman is doing to the church. The wicked woman, foreshadowed here by Delilah, of course, the wicked woman is trying to lull the church to sleep. And in the most part, she succeeded. The church is asleep. That's why the church has been devoured. Samson was devoured after she got him to go to sleep. Well, the church has fallen asleep a long time ago. And the church has now been devoured by the enemy. What does it say in 1 Peter 5 in verse 8? Be sober, be vigilant. Not woke, be sober and be vigilant because your adversary the devil walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The church has been devoured a long time ago. Why? Because the wicked woman put the church to sleep just like Delilah put Samson to sleep. In Proverbs 20, in verse 13, it says, Do not love sleep, lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes, and you'll be satisfied with bread. Now, that course is talking literally. It's talking about laziness. If all you want to do is sleep and not work, then you'll become poor, and you won't have any bread. But if you open your eyes, you'll be satisfied with bread. But, of course, there are spiritual meanings to these Proverbs, isn't there? When people are awake... They'll be satisfied with what? The bread of life. The bread of life, which Jesus said endures unto eternal life. Proverbs 24, verse 33, A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, 
so shall your poverty become like a prowler and your need like an armed man. Again, it's saying, if all you want to do is sleep, then you're going to be very poor. Well, because the church has fallen asleep, the church is now bankrupt. Now, of course, financially, yes, a lot of churches are going financially bankrupt. A lot of churches now can't pay their bills or pay their pastor. Why? Because they're empty. When you preach all this woke rubbish, people don't want to come and hear that. The reason the Church of England now is empty is because they're preaching the same woke nonsense that you hear in the world. That's why people don't want to come and hear it. You come to church to hear something different that you can't get in the world. Something that you can't get in the world is the truth of the Word of God. That's why people come to church. That's why you're here today, because you want to hear something that you can't get out there in the world. But the Church of England, or the Methodist Church, they're doing no different to what the world is. All this talk about pronouns and transgenderism and all this woke nonsense about climate change, that's what they're doing now. Well, people don't want to waste their time in church hearing that. They want to come and hear something different that they can't get in the world. That is why the Church of England has gone bankrupt. That is why. Go woke, go broke. I said that last week, didn't I? Go woke, go broke. That, of course, is the literal meaning. However, the spiritual meaning is also spiritual, spiritual bankruptcy. Because it's one of the things, again, that... Jesus told the church of Laodicea is that you are actually miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Laodicea was a very wealthy city. It was a very wealthy city. They put their trust in their wealth. But Jesus actually tells them, you are poor. If you have lots of money and lots of wealth, but you don't have Jesus, you're spiritually bankrupt. If you have not a penny to your name and you have Jesus Christ in your life... You're the richest person in the world. You're richer than someone who has a billion pounds in the bank, if you have Jesus Christ in your life. The Laodicean church thought they were rich, but Jesus said, you're bankrupt, you're poor. And that's what's happening to the church now. They're not only financially bankrupt, they're also spiritually bankrupt as well. Now, how then do we stay awake as a faithful church? How do we stay awake in these last days as we get closer and closer to the return of Christ there's a number of things that we are to do in order to stay awake. The first one, of course, is to pray. That prayer, you can't really stay awake the way Jesus wants us to. First Peter chapter 4, verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Again, Peter is talking about the last days here. This is specific to the last days. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Very important verse right there. First Peter chapter 4, verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. We are to be watchful in our prayers. With that in mind, turn to Matthew 26. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Now, one of the things we're supposed to do, as Peter just said is to be watchful in our prayers, but not just when it suits us, not just when it's convenient. We're actually supposed to be watchful in our prayers when times are difficult, when we are at our most vulnerable. That is when we are to pray more, not less. People, unfortunately, sometimes do the opposite. They pray when they, sorry, they don't pray when they really, really should be. They're not in fellowship when they really, really should be, when times are difficult. Well, we always use Jesus as our ultimate example, don't we? There are so many examples in the Word of God that Jesus himself has set us, and they are the ultimate examples that we are to use as believers. Matthew 26, from verse 36, this is Jesus' darkest hour, you could say, a time where he was weeping and sweating blood, literally, it tells us. Matthew 26, verse 36, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. And he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Jesus was sorrowful and deeply distressed. Because he knew what was about to happen to him. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face. And prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus didn't want to go through 
with what he was about to go through with. He didn't want to do it. He pleaded with the Father for his life. If it's possible, let this cup of suffering pass from me. Well, it wasn't possible, and that's why he had to go to the cross. It wasn't possible for you and I to be saved any other way. If there was any other way you and I could be saved, Jesus would never have had to go to the cross. But there was no other way, and that's why he had to go to the cross. Verse 40, then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. Exactly the same thing that we are warned about, falling asleep. He came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, what, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You ever sat there in front of the TV sometimes falling asleep? Your flesh is weak, your flesh is tired, your flesh wants to go to bed, but you're trying to stay awake. The spirit, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed. Jesus here is praying during his darkest hour, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass from me, unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand. The hour is at hand now for Christ to return, and people are out there asleep, aren't they? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being portrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And whilst he was still speaking, behold, Judas... One of the twelve, with a great multitude, with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the elders of the people. So the disciples stay, failed to stay awake during the time when Jesus needed them the most. But Jesus, being the ultimate example, was alert and watchful in his prayers during his darkest hour. And that's how we need to be, as Christians and as a church, is praying watchfully. Again, 1 Peter 4.7 is a very important verse in these last days, specific to these last days, that we are to be watchful in our prayers. What's the second thing we are to do to stay awake? Praying, of course, is one of the most major ones. Praying at a time where we're most vulnerable, like Jesus was, but also studying the Word of God. We can't be awake and we can't see unless we are studying the Word of God. We also need the illumination of the Holy Spirit. We need the oil in our lamps, don't we? Now, the thing is about the Word of God is that God is actually revealing more and more about it as we get closer to the end times. In Daniel chapter 12, in verse 4, it says, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. So what this is saying is, is that the book is going to be unsealed more and more as we get closer to the end. The closer we get to the end, the more God is revealing to us. Now, the church, the faithful church, that is, of course, has more knowledge about the last days than it did 50 or 60 years ago. That's not because 50 or 60 years ago they were unfaithful. No, it's because God is revealing more and more. The book of Revelation is actually called Apocalypse. Apocalypsis in Greek, and you'll see in many languages that the book of Revelation is called Apocalypse. Apocalypse does not mean the end of the world. That's what a lot of people assume it means. Whenever the sky goes all gloomy at sunset... People say it looks very apocalyptic tonight, doesn't it? That's not the meaning of the word apocalyptic. Apocalyptic means to reveal, hence why it's called revelation. It means an unveiling, like a curtain going up, like when they reveal a prize on a game show, for example. That's what the word apocalypse means. So the curtain is gradually going up higher. That's why the church, the faithful church, that is, is able to see more and able to understand more about the last days. Now be careful of anybody who says that they have figured out everything there is to figure out in the Word of God. Be careful of anyone who says, I know all there is to know about the Bible. <laughs> no. Even the world's most qualified theologian or scholar will not know everything there is to know about the Bible. Why? Because it's a sealed book which is still in the process of being revealed. We are still in the process of learning more and more about the Word of God because the curtain is gradually going higher. For the apostate church... It's not. The apostate church can't see. Why? Because they're asleep. But for the faithful church, God is revealing more and more about the last days. And that is why we need to be watchful in our prayers and study the word of God. We need to continually study the word of God. 
And of course, the third way is to be in fellowship. As we said in our Thursday Bible study in Hebrews chapter 10, in verse 25, we are not to neglect the gathering of the brethren. We are not to neglect the assembling of ourselves together. We must be in constant fellowship. Why? Because we sharpen one another. Iron sharpens iron. We help each other. We watch each other's backs. That is also what fellowship is for. When the enemy is prowling around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, he's not going to go for the pack. He's going to go for those who have strayed from the pack. Those who have strayed from the pack, they are the targets. They are the sitting ducks the enemy is going to go after. But he can't touch the pack. As long as you're in the pack, you're safe. That's why we must be in constant fellowship as we get closer to the end. And that's one of the things it says in Hebrews 10.25 is not just to not neglect fellowship, but also the more as you see the day approaching. Fellowship has always been important. It's always been something which believers have been commanded to do. But it gets more and more important as we see the day approaching. What's the day? The day of the return of Christ. The more we get closer to the return of Christ, the more important fellowship becomes. And a fourth way that we are to remain awake is to keep an eye on world events. We are to know what's going on in the world, especially events in the Middle East, in Israel. These things are key to studying end times prophecy. We are to be aware of what is happening in the world. Billy Graham said that we are to study end times prophecy with a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. And I do mostly agree with that. I'd argue which newspaper. Be careful which newspaper you're talking about. That was probably less of a problem back in Billy Graham's day. But there's a lot of fake news out there. So we are to study the word of God and we are to keep an eye on world events. That would also help us in our study of the last days. Jesus said in Luke 21 verse 28, Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. So when you see these things happening, again, Luke 21 parallels Matthew 24. There's a very specific list of events that Jesus highlighted that will take place in the lead up to his return. When we see these things happening, when we see these things taking place, look up because your redemption draws near. When we see Israel, we born as a nation, which happened 76 years ago, look up for your redemption draws near. The, re the rebirth of the nation of Israel was a major turning point in, term, in terms of end time prophecy. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 in verse 13. This is how Paul closes off the first epistle to the Corinthians. Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Look at those commandments there. Be on the alert. Rick Warren says don't study end time prophecy. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Don't waver. Act like men. Do you hear that, guys? Act like men. God hates it when men act like women, prancing around in high heels and miniskirts and things like this. Act like men and be strong. Be strong in the faith, that is. Now, if that was important then, when 1 Corinthians was written, if that was important then, how important is it now? It must be a hundred times more important now than it was then. It's important now to be on the alert, to stand firm in the faith, to act like men and to be strong. Why? Because Jesus is coming very, very soon. And because he's coming very soon, that's why we have to be awake, just like the bride always had to be awake. You've heard me talk before about how the Jewish wedding used to work. The groom would go away for a period of time. After the betrothal, after they became engaged, the groom would then go away for a period of time. And during that time, he'd be preparing a house for them to live in, normally an annex on his father's house. He'd be preparing a house for them to live in. Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, I have gone to prepare a place for you, and then I'm going to come back and receive you unto myself. Well, Jesus has gone away, and the bride had to be ready. When the groom went away, normally for a period of about a year, the groom would go away for a period of about a year, but the bride would have to be ready, she'd have to be dressed, and she'd have to be awake. That's one of the things the bride had to be, was awake. Well, the church is not awake, the church is asleep. The church is not dressed. The church is not dressed in the righteousness of Christ, the garments of salvation and the robes of righteousness. The church has taken off those garments. 
There's more about that in Song of Songs, about the bride who took off her veil, whose hands was dripping with myrrh. What's myrrh mean? It means death, doesn't it, in the Bible? Whenever you see myrrh, it's talking about death. That's the church who's not ready. That's the church who's asleep. That's the church who's hesitant. The bride who is faithful was dressed in the white, of course, the pure white linen, the robes of righteousness and the garments of salvation. She was ready and she was awake. The bride has to be ready and awake. Are we ready and awake for the Lord to return? Because the church has fallen asleep. But one of the reasons that God has put bread of life right here in Clacton is to wake people up. That is one of our assignments as a church, brothers and sisters. The problem with that is, is people don't like to be woken up. When people are asleep in the dark, they don't like to be woken up. I'm ex-army, I can tell you all about that. Having someone come in at five o'clock in the morning and turn the light on and start hollering is not nice. But why do they do it? They do it for your good. They do it because it's time to train and get ready for warfare. That's why they do it, isn't it? Well, God has given us that assignment. We are to wake people up. God is using this church as a battering ram to get people awake. Now, some people don't want to wake up. Some people you can't wake up. Why? Because some people are dead spiritually. You can't wake up someone who's dead. And that is the problem in the church today, is that the church is spiritually dead. You can't wake up someone who's dead. But someone who's fallen asleep, you can wake up. And that's why in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus then makes his appeal not to the church, but to the individuals, to those who hear me knocking, to those who open the door and let me in, I will come in and dine with them. His appeal is no longer to the church, but to the individuals. That's why we're out there getting people to wake up. That's why we're out there telling people that it's critical now more than ever to get yourself right with God. Why? Because we are living in the last days. Soon, their time is going to run out. Now, of course, when someone dies, their time runs out. But the thing is, Jesus might turn, return before that. Their time runs out on the day they die or on the day that Jesus Christ returns, whichever one happens first. And you don't know which one is going to happen first. That's the whole point. That's why we're out there waking people up, getting the false Christians out there to actually get themselves right with God because they're oblivious to what's going on. They're oblivious to what's going on in the Middle East. They're oblivious to all these woke agendas taking place in the church now. They're completely blind. They're completely asleep. And it's our job to wake them up. Some will wake up, some won't. But the reason we go out and do it is for the ones who will. Jesus said he will leave 99 sheep to go and search for the one who's gone astray. Well, we go out and search for the one lost sheep, don't we? If 99 people have gone astray and we go out and search for that one sheep, then our mission is worthwhile, brothers and sisters. So God is going to continue to use us as a battering ram to wake people up, to get the church off its behind doing the work of the Lord. And that is a difficult assignment, but the reason that you are in this fellowship, the reason that God has led you here is because you have what it takes. And what is that? The power and anointing of the Holy Spirit. The oil in our lamps. Once we have the oil, we can then see the word of God makes sense. And that is what God is doing right here in Clacton through Bread of Life Community Church. And it's a privilege to have you, brothers and sisters, on board with this mission. And we praise Jesus for you guys. We praise Jesus for everybody here who can see and who are awake, not woke. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this gathering. Lord, we pray now that you will help us to be watchful in our prayers, just as we've been commanded to in 1 Peter 4, 7. Help us to be watchful in our prayers as we are in the end of all things. Lord, we pray that you'll give us more discernment. We pray that you'll sharpen our discernment, Lord. Help us to sharpen one another as iron sharpens iron. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll just bless this fellowship, Lord. We thank you for the men and women of God you are raising up in this church. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us an abundance of oil so that we can see. We have oil in our lamps so that we can see through the lies of these last days. We can see through the darkness. We can see through the lies of the enemy. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for that blessing of the oil that you've given us, Lord. Help us to go out and continue waking people up, Lord. Help us to challenge people, to get people out of their comfort zones. Help us, Lord, to bring people into a deeper relationship with you, Lord. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll protect this church. 
protect us from the schemes of the enemy because he does prowl around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And Lord, we pray for your ultimate protection over us as individuals and as a church body. We thank you again for the privilege of serving you, Lord. We thank you for the privilege and honour of being ambassadors of Jesus Christ, that we get to represent you, Lord, in this dark world. We get to represent the Most High, the Kingdom of God. Help us to remain awake during these last days, because we know that the wicked woman, spiritual deception, is trying to lull us to sleep. Help us to remain awake, even when it's our darkest hour, even when we are our most vulnerable, just like your dear son was in that garden of Gethsemane. Thank you, Lord, that we have his example. Thank you, Lord, that we have the word of God illuminated by the oil of the Holy Spirit. And as the curtain keeps on going up, as you keep on revealing more and more, help us to know more about your word and about you and about the things which are to come, the events of the last days that must transpire. And Lord, we do thank you for this gathering, for this day, But we thank you above all for Jesus. We thank you for our saviour. We thank you that he shed his blood on the cross. And we thank you that he rose from the dead on the third day. That we have a living saviour. And thank you Lord that we are no longer children of wrath. But we are now children of God. Thank you that we are not sons of darkness. But we are sons of the light. We look forward to his return. Help us to be ready. Help us to be awake. We praise you and thank you. The Lord of lords. The King of kings. Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus Christ of Nazareth in whose name we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Amen. We praise the Lord.